Elie Wiesel is here. He has earned an international reputation for his teachings on the horror and human tragedy of the Holocaust. He has been awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the United States Congressional Gold Medal, the French Legion of Honor. In 1986, he was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. He has written more than 40 books. They include Night, his critically acclaimed memoir. He currently has two new books. One is called The Judges. It is a work of fiction. Also, After the Darkness, Reflections on the Holocaust provides a distillation of the most important aspects of Hitler's years in power. I am pleased to have Elie Wiesel, as always, back at this table. Welcome, sir. my friend. Good to have you here. Uh, this is the first time you have put in paper something about the Holocaust since night, is it not? Well, I have written some articles. Yeah, but I mean Essays. a book. A it's book. A book, no. This is the first, the first one, time. Yes. Yeah. Why did you return to this? Oh, I was asked to do it by yeah. a publisher who was persistent, and I yeah. felt 50 years later maybe I should try and say not something new. There isn't much to say that I haven't said already, right. but put it together, yeah. mainly for young people. Different voices. Me, also survivors, to have yeah. survivors participate in this endeavor, to say, look, we have seen it, we have endured it, and let's try not to repeat it. So how did you go about putting it together? I mean, you, you had the great help from the Holocaust Museum. Well, first I wrote the essay, right. the main essay. And then I have uh, one of my former uh, TAs at City College, a man, young man named Rosenzaff, he collected the uh, excerpts from memoirs that we are publishing later on. Later on? Yeah. yeah. There is, just so that I understand it, there's a Shoah project which is a collection of interviews, Steven Spielberg and others. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, are, are you convinced that everything is being done to record the memory of all of those who somehow are still alive? Charlie, even if all of us had done nothing else in our lives, all of us, but given testimony still, maybe the most important thing would have remained, would remain unsaid. There is so much to say. But a person, just a person, how that person went through that period, or a, a community, how that community was disintegrated, taken away, annihilated, there is so much to say. And we don't have enough time, maybe enough, not enough talent yeah. or patience to say it. Yet there is a feeling among publishers that it's all been said. Publishers like to be, uh, you know, successful, and therefore they only publish things that sell. My preoccupation is not the sale of a book, but the reading of a book. I'll, I'll give you an example. I have written two books that make a special, a their own way, a special way, a night mm -hmm. and a beggar in Jerusalem. Right. Night, in the beginning, was read, but nobody bought it. Yes. <laughs> a beggar in Jerusalem, because it got a price in Paris, it sold, but nobody read it. <laughs> <laughs> now, why was that in that case? Because it's a novel, a very complex novel, and people, yeah. you know, they bought it because it yeah. got a price, and, uh, yeah. and I prefer that people should read. You still have written at the beginning of this that you're reluctant to talk about the past. Not about the past, about that past. I've, I've talked about my childhood. I don't mean because, history, yeah. But about that past, because I don't know how. It's difficult to be personal. I don't like to speak about my suffering. I speak about other people's suffering. And all my work on behalf of human rights meant to speak about other people's pain and agony uh, or, or imprisonment or, or, or victimhood, not mine. Mm. And therefore I don't speak about it. In my lectures I, I, I speak about philosophy, about literature, about uh, history, but not about my, my past. What do you remember, what do the people in your town say and remember about the coming of the Nazis? Oh, they didn't really... Uh, I was too young to remember everything, and I was too involved in, in, in religious studies, in Talmudic studies, biblical studies, so I didn't pay attention to topics of the day. But people were not really that concerned, because we in Romania, later in Hungary, we had it rather good, in spite of the anti-Semitism that existed, that exists everywhere. Uh, we knew that an anti-Semite hates Jews, so what? We survived the pogroms, we survived the Inquisition, we just survived that too. Until very late, until the Germans came in into our town 
in March 19, 1944. Yeah, but there, there are testimony that happened. People know exactly when everything changed. You know, in our the case, powerful stories of, of watching a synagogue being burned and people standing around not doing anything, mainly to prevent the fire from spreading. That we knew. We knew about the Kristallnacht, for instance, in Germany when right. they burned synagogues. But we didn't know about Auschwitz. To me, really, that is the greatest mystery and pain, by the way, about people that I admired, like Roosevelt and Churchill, for instance. They knew, but we didn't. 1944, a few weeks before B-Day. Yeah. Charlie, we could have run in, in, into the forest and, and we, could, we could have uh, find a hiding place with our maid, a marvelous Christian lady, or a, a housekeeper, a maid. But we didn't know. If we had known, half of my town, maybe more, would have survived. Didn't know? We didn't know. When we came to Auschwitz later in May, at the end of May, and we saw the word Auschwitz, we didn't know what it meant. We thought it was just a little town, somewhere in Poland. I'm, I'm always stunned by this, because... So am I. You, so are you. So, you know, that somebody didn't tell, somebody didn't tell, somebody. Nobody. Washington knew, Stockholm knew, Switzerland knew, the Vatican knew, London knew, but we didn't. There is a story, which you know about, and, and I'm, I've forgotten exactly who told me the story, where I read it, is that someone came to see Felix Frankfurter. Right. Jan Karski. Yeah. And Jan Karski. And Karski said, I don't believe you. Yeah. Frankfurter said, I don't believe yes. you. Said, I don't Karski. believe you. Frankfurter said, I don't believe you. Yeah. And Kaski was, of course, he was a marvelous Polish man. I knew him well. Oh, yeah, I knew yeah. him very, very yeah. well. And tell me the story. What do you mean? Do you think I'm lying? He said, no. You tell the truth, but I don't believe you. I simply cannot believe that these things are possible. And Felix Frankfurter was a good friend of Franklin Roosevelt. Very close. Then he went to see Roosevelt. Roosevelt said something, you know, uh, don't worry, we shall do whatever we can, but Nothing was done, except there was war going on. We must be honest But Roosevelt's ourselves. defenders continue to defend him on I this know, account. I know, but to me, Roosevelt was a father figure. In my town, I didn't know the name of David Ben-Gurion. You didn't know who David Ben-Gurion no, was, but I knew who founder was. of the State of Israel? But I knew Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Yeah. And we prayed for him. And then after... And cried when he died. I was then... He, I was still in Buchenwald when he died. It was one day after liberation when we heard that he died. And it was, of course, but later on I realized what it meant to have a Roosevelt who was no longer there. But when I came to America and began researching documents, I realized that he knew the fact that the Allies didn't even bomb the railways going to Auschwitz is to me a mystery. I don't understand it. What's the explanation? That they couldn't divert anything from the war effort. At that time, 10,000, 12,000 Jews were being killed every And they day. knew that? Course, they, they knew the they extent knew of it? That. Now we know that they knew now, How did they know the extent of it? First, from the underground, the Polish underground, they knew everything, and, and, and uh, the information went to London. Then also through the Enigma, the code, they broke the right, code. Right, and right. through that code, they knew everything that was going the on. The German code was broken in the Enigma project. Right. So they knew? They knew. And Churchill? Same thing. I don't understand it, believe me, Charlie. I, I, don't, I don't have the answer for it, because these are good people. Churchill was a good, a very great man, the great man of the century. It was well, Churchill, I think. Really. Without Churchill, Hitler might have... Oh, yeah, absolutely. The way he fought at his speeches, he didn't have a speechwriter, but the way his speeches and, and his statements, they were great. He was a great man, which means a man of greatness. So was Roosevelt. What he did for America here, domestically, or even when he led America into war was, was a great act of courage and vision. It came to Jews, somehow we were negligible. Do you forgive? Oh, who am I to judge? Really? I'm not a judge, I'm just a witness. Is that how you see all of this? Always. Just a witness, not a judge? I'm a witness. I, I don't but does it people. extend to everybody? Oh, not, not to the killers. You are a judge? There, I'm a judge. You don't like the word Holocaust? <laughs> because there are no words for it. There is no language for it. I, even I, I have written on it. I, I tried 
I try to awaken this generation to, to that tragedy. I went around for years, I was going around speaking when nobody else did, so I went around speaking, now I don't. And I realized the problem is that somehow the enemy has managed to push his crime beyond language. There are no words for it. How can one speak about it when it is unspeakable? And yet we must speak. We must bear witness. How do you feel about the security of the Israeli state today? You know, I'm worried. I'm terribly worried simply because I think we spoke about it even here with you on this program, about the terror. I think the enemy and the danger, the threat, is terror. Imagine nuclear terror, bacteriological terror, chemical terror, what, what, what the terrorists can do today to the whole world and to Israel because Israel is vulnerable. Israel is threatened more than any other nation. So what do you think the Palestinian people deserve? Oh, I think they deserve their, well, absolutely they deserve their, their aspirations should, should come true. They, they deserve a state and they will have a state. I repeat actually what Prime Minister Sharon is saying. He is for two states, but under one condition, no terror. I believe no civilized nation should give in to terror, especially suicide terror. I, I, I would propose that Internationally, we should, we should identify a suicide terror, suicide killer as a crime against humanity. Just to imagine hmm. parents who are sending their children to kill and be killed. Uh, Sometimes the parents aren't sending them, they're just there. But some parents uh, do. I hear them on television saying how proud they are that, that their yeah. child, their son became yeah. a Shahid. Well, they, but they that, but, uh, and sometimes they didn't even know, but I mean, then some clearly did know. Well, uh, and then they also accept, in some cases, some people accept money, money from. But, but the main thing is they call that they call them martyrs. Look, we Jews and Christians, we had our martyrs. Uh, Jews had martyrs, Christians had martyrs at the beginning of our history. But one thing we do know: the martyr is not somebody who kills for his or her faith. It is somebody who dies for his or her faith. I don't know of any example of martyrs who killed for their faith. And here you have a whole generation which is trying actually to, to, to fulfill a dream, a kind of, of strange dream, mm. to kill and be killed. I think the moment that stops, I would give, I would ask for a moratorium of three months, just of three months, no terror for three months. I'm convinced that Israel will make a gesture, a very generous gesture and start again. And then everything is possible. Do you think Sharon is a better leader for the Israeli people today than Netanyahu said? Look, I'm not an Israeli. I never lived in Israel. I, I cannot give them uh, political, uh, advice. political advice. But I know one thing. Israel, the Israel as a nation voted for Sharon because I think the people know who is best for them. And they voted for Sharon because Sharon, my feeling is he will make peace. Uh, I think he had such a brilliant, glorious military career that now the time has come for him. To as be a peacemaker. It, peacemaker. As it happened for Abin, a peacemaker. Like, like you know, the, only the goal could, could make peace in Algeria. Mm -hmm. Only Nixon went to China. That means we need a right-wing man to, to implement left-wing policies. Do you have any criticisms of the Israeli military action settlements? Oh, these are... Uh, these are incursions I, I, into deaths of... Again, let terror stop. And I am really convinced, I, I, believe me, I believe it, that it will, it will be solved. But terror must stop. I don't think Israel can or should give in to terror. No one there thinks so. I mean, but that's, it's, most people believe that. You cannot give but in to you terror. Don't. You cannot, otherwise you are lost. You have an interesting idea, which is that, some, that, that um, Muslims should declare somebody to declare a fatwa yeah. against suicide bombers. Yes, a fatwa. Come out with a decree against suicide bombers. Absolutely. As it, and they may even say, look, the Palestinians, they should say, we Muslims agree with you. You deserve your state. And therefore, we, we will help you. We will even fight for you and with you. But no suicide bombers. This book, I should say that what is accompanied in this book are, are lots of pictures and, and um, let me just show some of them, and, and I'll run through them. Here's two young 
concentration camp survivors display their tattoos from the concentration camp. You'll see it over here. This must be hard pictures for you to look at. Uh, the next is uh, lining up for a roll call at Buchenwald, where following the arrest during Kristallnacht. There is a picture of that. You can see it there. And the next picture is um, thousands of Jews are captured and deported during the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto. Next is Auschwitz stands liberated in January 1945. There's the fence. Uh, next, 400 liberated Jewish youth, including you, who is sitting on the train but not pictured. You were sitting on this very train. Ride to freedom from Buchenwald to France in June 1945. You still write in French, don't you? Yeah. Could you think in French? I think in French, yes. It was because it was your... No, I learned it after the war. When I came to France, I didn't know a single old? word. I was 16. And now, you, and now you think in French rather than English? Rather than... I, I teach and in English. I can write an article in English. Even then, it has to be edited and corrected by Marie or my wife. Really? But, yeah, but, but in French, it's my, it's my language. There's a, three survivors of Auschwitz to play their tattoo, tattoos more than 40 years later. This book contains all these um, photographs. Um, after the darkness, reflections on the Holocaust. There is also this, The Judges, a novel, a nonfiction, uh, which Lamone says, Elie has written an astonishing novel celebrating the triumph of life. Uh, tell me the story, to set up the story for me. So there's a plane going from New York to Tel Aviv. It lands in Actually, Connecticut. Actually, it's a story about terror. Five people who don't know one another yeah. are in the same plane. Right. There's a storm. Yes. Forced landing, yes. and they find themselves in a room, yes. and all of a sudden there is a judge who is their host who becomes a terrorist. They have to defend their life, a and each one actually has to justify has to justify his or her life. They don't know why. There's no reason for it. This man is crazy, but then terrorists can be crazy too. And what will happen then? What is happening? There? And I feel I wrote it so many years ago. And somebody in France told me, do you know that the, the... This was published in France when? Four or five years ago. 99, I yeah. think, yeah. 98 or 98 or so. I didn't 99. Know, I think yes. I thought 99. Yes. Anyway. Sorry, yeah. okay. So years ago, I wrote this years ago. And they said, look, that's exactly what's happening today. You have now a terrorist. They take these 19 terrorists, two planes. Yeah. They have never met those people. They had nothing to do with why? What is it you want to tell? What story here? Oh, here I want to tell you that we are each other's judges. That's why I call it the judges in plural. Or we will all be judged. <laughs> and we shall all be judged, exactly. Yeah. Because whatever is happening to one person actually affects all the others. Okay. After such an experience, one is no longer the same. Tell me the characters, these five. Oh, you have one, let's say, one is a George who, is a, who works in the, uh, in the government, the American government, and he discovered a document, and he has to go to Israel to, to ask for some advice. This is a, because there's someone who's in the Australian, Austrian government. Austrian government, and who is a friend of Israel right. now, but he had a doubtful yes. past, suspicious right. past. Then there is Claudia, a beautiful girl, who, who, is a, uh, who works for a theater. Yeah. And she fell in love with an Israeli. And then there is a, an Israeli officer who is, has cancer coming from the hospital. And then there is a man named Bruce who is a Don Juan. Simply go, he's going around from woman to woman to ask for forgiveness because he had seduced too many of them. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a fifth one is a kind of mystical young man who, when he was young, he was arrested by the communist uh, regime and they removed part of his memory. They, dis they had discovered a certain way of, of removing, of doing surgery of his memory. Mm. And therefore he doesn't remember exactly, some years. He they invaded his brain they, and did They something. totally disappeared from it. They vanished from his brain. And he's going there to look for his teacher, the man, the man that he met in that prison, actually. So they meet. Yeah. And then they have the same guy who is a terrorist. And who says, one, of, one person is going to die yeah. here before, tomorrow, before at dawn and somebody dies. So I wrote a thriller, a kind of philosophical thriller, and I wrote it with a smile because... If I ask about whether there is a driving obsession in your life, is there one? Obsession. What the obsession? Something you must do. 
I know I must bear witness. Bear witness is it. To not only to the past, but to the present as well. And I also have the feeling I haven't done enough. So I'm a teacher, and I'm terribly uh, fond of my students. I'm very close to my students. I, 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 I cannot tell you, because they, they may learn about it, how, how I feel when I come into class, just to be with them. And of course, I'm a family. I have, you know, I, I, mm. you know, you know, you know yes. my wife, you yeah. know my son, and of course, it's, it's very special for me. But the main thing, my obsession is to bear witness. Yeah. Really. Uh, this book by Elie Wiesel is called The Judges. It is a thriller, as we said. It is also a study uh, celebrating the triumph of life, says Lamont, and it is also a study of character. This book, After the Darkness, as I said, uh, photographs from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, reminds us of a terrible, terrible, the most terrible time. Thank you for coming. Thank you. We'll be right back. Stay with us.